Good afternoon. My name is Nicola Bedlington, former Secretary General of the European Patients Forum and Senior Advisor to FH Europe. I'm really honoured to moderate this afternoon's technical meeting dedicated to FH paediatric screening, exploring current gaps in provision and how we can address these effectively in Europe. I'm pleased to welcome political leaders from Slovenia, currently hosting the EU Council Presidency, leading representatives from the patients, scientific and healthcare professional cardiovascular disease and FH communities, and European and national level policymakers. Over the next three hours together, we'll share a whole range of perspectives on how to move forward together to achieve consensus on what needs to happen now to ensure that patients and citizens have equitable access to screening in all countries in our region. Before we kick off, a couple of housekeeping matters. All participants are muted. There are no videos apart from the speakers. And you're invited and welcome to use the chat function to contribute questions and comments. These won't be addressed directly in today's meeting because of time constraints, but we'll make sure to capture them in the report that will circulate afterwards. The event will be recorded and disseminated to all of those who are unable to attend today's meeting. So to kick off this afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to introduce two mothers from France, Véronique Charles and Charlotte Lemaitre, to share their own personal stories on the impact of FH on their lives and why they feel paediatric screening really matters. We're thrilled to have you with us to really set the scene from a patient's perspective. Please feel warmly welcomed. Veronique, we will start with your story. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola, for your kind introduction. And good afternoon to all participants in today's technical meeting. My name is Veronique. I am 42 years old and live in the east of France. I'm active in the metal industry. I have two children, Victor 14 and Lorraine 11. I will tell you my story through 30 years of FH disease. When I was a child, my mother had a heart attack. She was only 14. The doctors found that hypercholesterolemia was the only risk factor. A few months later, my sister Claire 13, I 12, and my brother Yves 9 had a blood test. We all three had high rates of cholesterol we were identified as FH. We changed our eating habits, but it was not enough. At the age of 15, my sister and I started statins with good results. Cholesterol rate dropped and we had almost no side effects. As my brother was too young, he tried castron but could not tolerate it. No one was much worried, time passed. Suddenly, as he was 14, my brother died while he was running alone in the garden. This event was a cataclysm in our family life. No investigations were carried out to find the cause of his death. I suppose my parents felt terribly guilty. The subject became taboo. I became a student, a young active adult, and for different reasons, I did not take the statins regularly. I felt quite in good health until I was 30. At the time, I was pregnant with my second child, and I had the first sensations of heaviness in my chest. I felt dizzy, but I didn't tell my doctor about it. I was afraid of not being believed or that my pregnancy would end badly. I managed these anxiety symptoms on my own with breathing and relaxation exercises. After I gave birth, I still felt tired all the time. It was as if I couldn't recover after an effort. I put it down to being a working mother of two young children. I lived like that without consulting a doctor, without complaining. When I was 34, my mom had her third heart attack. That made me think about the fact that I was not taking good care of myself. I decided to consult a doctor. She prescribed a blood test. Of course, cholesterol was high. When I consulted again, she wrote a letter for a visit to cardiologist. I hadn't seen one for 17 years. At the cardiologist, I described my symptom, feeling exhausted, tightness in my chest. I told him that I had a genetic background. He gave me an electrocardiogram, which was apparently okay. He told me, you have a great heart. 
maybe you're depressed. I took my statins for four or five months in early 2014. Then I said to myself, what's the point since I have a great heart? Obviously, my symptoms did not disappear. They even increased until they became unbearable. I had feelings of near death, especially at night. One morning, I decided to change my route from home to work to drive past the cardiologist and try to make an appointment. I was lucky enough to see a secretary who listened to me. She immediately set me up for the electrocardiogram. The cardiologist gave me a spray of nitroxide and told me I was having a heart attack right there, right then. He called an ambulance right away. My heart was saved. I was 35 years old with two little children and three stents. Coming back home three days later, I asked myself, what happened to me, the same as my mother, and what happened to my brother so long ago? I consulted subjects on hypercholesterolemia on the internet and found Annette, the French FH Patient Association. I got in touch with them and found great moral support. Also, the association advised me to test my children as soon as possible, which I did. Their cholesterol rate is quite low, even if they both have the same defect gene as me. As a mom, these investigations clearly reduce my worry about my children's health. Also, I invited my sister to do the test for her two children, and her boy was diagnosed with FH. My feeling today is that early testing is crucial. FH awareness and understanding is crucial. And addressing mental health impact of fear, isolation, and taboo is crucial. If we can protect our children and future generations from this through screening, the impact will be enormous. Thank you for listening and hopefully for acting. I would now like to give the floor to Charlotte to share her different yet painfully similar story. Thank you, Veronique, for giving me the floor. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to, ad to address this technical meeting. My name is Charlotte, I'm 35 and I live in Paris. I was born into a family of three siblings. I had one brother and one sister. I am also a mother of two marvelous children, Marino, my daughter, who is five, and Basil, my son, who is two. Cholesterol has always been part of my life. We knew there were some cholesterol problems in the family. Indeed, my mom had us tested when we were young. My brother and I were diagnosed with a high cholesterol rate. I remember that my mom had us follow a specific cooking class to learn how to take care of our cholesterol in the way we cook and we eat. We saw several doctors, but it seems back then there was no, they were not really sure if we needed to be treated or not as children. We had to take a horrible treatment at one point that we quickly decided to give up as it, as it was too disgusting. Then my uncle Antoine had a heart attack at the age of 40 and it raised alarm bells on the real risk of having a high cholesterol rate. My mom took us to the endocrinologist again and decided that my brother must be treated. At that time, he was 17 and I was 19. The doctor explained that my brother must be treated, but I, because I'm a woman, I was apparently magically protected by my hormones. We grew up and we started our studies. My brother, at least, started to study medicine the famous, stressful, and very difficult first year as a medical student. He was really under pressure with the, with the study. He smoked a lot, and um, he finally got accepted to the second year. During summer, he decided to go hiking in the mountains with some friends, and he found it very difficult. The day of his returned second year, he died alone at home 
from a massive heart attack. After this tragedy, and started even if I had this tragedy in my family it is still very difficult to understand the silent disease and to be very serious with, with the treatments after this tragic terrible event I went back to the doctor and started treatment even if I had this tragedy in my family it is still very difficult to understand the silent disease and to be very serious with the treatments. Now I am a mum, and I just found out that my daughter, my daughter Marilou, is also unfortunately diagnosed with FH. I also feel lucky now to be well informed about the disease and the risk, risk factor so that I can take good care of myself and of course of my daughter. I know that she must, that she can take treatments at early age in order to avoid another tragic, tragic situation. I also know that only 10% of people are actually diagnosed, so screening must be organized on a large scale for children, followed by appropriate treatment so we can save lives. This is why I believe this meeting is so very important. It is in my eyes a real opportunity to avoid the situation Veronique and I have lived through. As I see, as I see it, um, there is good practice on FH screening in some parts of Europe. Surely it must be a right for all EU citizens who wish to have access to screening and as well a universal screening we need to think about raising awareness and understanding about the, among the public at large about FH and how this can be addressed effectively to protect lives. poignant and capture precisely why we're here today. I'd now like to invite Magna, Magda Dela Dacor, who is the Chief Executive of FH Europe, to welcome you all and to build on these two presentations, to give a glimpse about the unmet needs of patients and citizens within FH in Europe. Magdalena, I know your passion and your commitment to your community. A very warm welcome to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, thank you, Veronique and Charlotte, for your courage to open this important technical meeting. You have shared with us your very own tragic and painful stories, and yet those are the stories of many families and individuals affected with a phage. There are estimated two and a half million individuals born with a phage in Europe, and one and a half million in the EU only. 300,000 of them are children. Most of the time when we talk about patient unmet needs, we refer to the lack of treatment. Yet, when it comes to FH, the treatment exists. Yes, it might not be available everywhere and to everyone on the same terms and conditions, but it exists. The unmet needs in the context of FH are different. Familial hypercholesterolemia means literally occurring in the family high cholesterol. To start, it is inherited. Behind every individual with a phage, there is a family affected with it. The fundamental challenge with a phage is the lack of appreciation that it is a genetic condition, a non-modifiable cardiovascular risk factor, which is triggered from birth, independently from the diet or the level of physical activity. Despite being the most common inherited condition in the world, FH is seriously undetected. One in every 300 persons has it. Yet it is estimated that less than 10% of patients with FH are currently identified. That means nine in every 10 people living with dangerously high cholesterol are absolutely unaware of the 
of their genetic condition. They go on living as usual, exposed to high risk of premature cardiovascular disease and its irreversible consequences. On one hand, we have a small proportion of diagnosed patients with FH who face some very specific challenges. Despite the presence of guidelines, most of them do not meet the recommended targets. Women, in particular, are the more frequent victims of heart attacks and strokes in Europe. Many miss years of treatment due to family planning, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. Off treatment periods can reach even 10 years. Children are mostly diagnosed as the index cases. That means something terribly wrong must have happened in their family and they were tested as a result. Inherited high cholesterol is unknown, misunderstood, and as a result, downplayed, often mistaken for lifestyle consequences, where root causes are rarely investigated. Once identified as a genetic condition, it is being labeled as high risk and penalized. High health insurance premiums, no life insurance, no bank loan, some jobs being out of reach, personal life plans often impacted, family relations put at strain. Those are some frequent obstacles people with a fate experience in daily life. Those are the reasons many choose not to openly share about it. Those are some of the reasons there are very few FH patient ambassadors. On the other hand, we have the 90% of people affected yet not correctly diagnosed and not treated. They live with an invisible, silent killer condition. And because FH is unknown and misunderstood, it is not being proactively looked for. Because it is not being proactively looked for, it is found late. Family history of high cholesterol does not set off alarm bells at the GPs, nor at the pediatricians, and surely not at the gynecologist's office. Well, it does not make any of us rush to get proactively a cholesterol test either. The only time the presence of high cholesterol and its family history sets off the alarm bells is at the cardiologist's office, but that's often too late. Most people are diagnosed with FH at the time of their first heart attack, or the most that is at the age of 40. One in 17 heart attacks occurs as a result of FH. Inherited high cholesterol, you cannot touch it, nor feel it, and most of the times you cannot see it. The invisible killer, the silent ticking bomb condition, was named a global public health burden by the World Health Organization in 19. 98. Since then, new calls to action have been published, new treatments have been developed, and guidelines have been updated. However, little progress has been made to resolve this cardiovascular health issue effectively. It required a global pandemic to realize how big the CVD burden has been and how neglected and urgent the issue continues to be. Today, I'm very humbled and delighted to be addressing you all at this very important meeting, surrounded by patients and patient advocates, international leading experts and very supportive partners, and clearly committed policymakers present here advocating together for FH childhood screening. FH Europe is 27 and soon to be 29 European patient organizations strong. It is the united and the leading voice on behalf of patients with FH and the citizens who have not been identified yet. We are a proud member of the World Heart Organization, the European Patients Forum and Eurotis. We can partner with the EAS FHS, FH Studies Collaboration the Global FH Registry, and collaborate with the leading scientific societies. And very recently, together with 15 other international health organizations, we have formed the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health to call on the EU for concrete actions and to prioritize cardiovascular health. The time is right. We have the best practices. We have the knowledge. We have the tools. We have the evidence, strong partnerships, the will, 
and the energy. We have this unique window of opportunity in no small part, thanks to the tremendous support of the Slovenian EU presidency. My huge thanks to everybody who has been part of this. Let's not get discouraged by the size of the burden, but be motivated and inspired by the potential to save lives and prevent CVD. Let's detect the detectable and treat the treatable. The time is now to make FH pediatric screening a common good practice across Europe. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much, Magdalena, for putting Veronique and Charlotte's story into a wider context and also conveying the strength and potential of a united FH patient and citizens movement throughout, through FH Europe as, as a vibrant network. I'd now like to turn to the Slovenian EU presidency to hear from Minister Mark Boris Adrianic, responsible for digital transformation. As we all know, digital transformation and the value of health data are the topics of the moment as we move towards a European health union. Minister Andrianic, we are extremely honoured that you've made time to join us today to add your words of welcome and to share with us your thoughts on how the revolution in digital health can impact on FH pediatric screening. The floor is yours. Dear Minister, dear members of the European Parliament, dear esteemed guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and pleasure to join you today at this key meeting on familial hypercholesterolemia pediatric screening. The importance of this topic was poignantly clear in the presentations from France. And I would like to personally thank both speakers for their very powerful and moving contributions. It is also clear from Mrs. Dacourt's intervention that the unmet needs in relation to FH pediatric screening are profound and far reaching. Like my esteemed colleague, Minister Poklukar, I'm very pleased that this technical meeting has been arranged under the Slovenian EU presidency. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the scientific and medical community in Slovenia for their outstanding work in establishing a universal screening program in Slovenia and for being the torchbearer for other countries. My message to you today is that digital health and responsible health data sharing are critical tools in facilitating a more comprehensive and systematic approach to F8 screening in Europe. During the period of the Slovenian EU presidency, a major focus has been placed on the European health data space, creating a harmonized ecosystem in which data can flow freely and safely. This will advance science, support research, and enhance healthcare decision-making. It will also provide an ideal backdrop for more opportunities within the FH community to advance on EU-wide sharing of data of patients with FH, building on existing sterling work by the global FH registry. As we move forward on FH pediatric screening in Europe, new opportunities for interoperability and cross-country exchange will arise using state-of-the-art digital tools and infrastructure. We have seen how machine learning and advanced analytics support screening programs in other disease areas. I'm very curious as to how this might be applied effectively also in the FH world. I also believe that this can reduce the costs linked to screening programs, improving access and human impact. For all of this to happen, we need to work together collaboratively. We need to ensure trust and broad acceptance of the benefits of digitalization and health data sharing. Dedicated education and access programs will go a long way to support this and help to counter the digital divide that threatens to exacerbate existing health inequalities in Europe. It is also important to improve digital health literacy amongst healthcare professionals working in this very area. That will allow to seize the full potential of digital tools and cutting edge technologies. I wish you a very good discussion for the reminder of this important day. I'm very interested in learning more about the conclusions of the meeting and how 
we can all contribute to making FH pediatric screening a reality. Thank you very much, Minister Andrianich. It's really very clear that digitalization, smart use of data will be key enablers and accelerators in health, but also specifically in the area of FH pediatric screening. We're now moving to the wider cardiovascular disease landscape, and I'm really very, very pleased to welcome Maria de Grazie Cavallo, member of the European Parliament and co-chair of the MEP Heart Group. Dr. Marianne Taki, Doctor of Public Health, Policy Coordinator at DG Sante, the Director Responsible for Health in the European Commission. Birgit Beger, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the European Heart Network, a member of the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health that Magda mentioned a little earlier. And Dr. Ma Morius Gianta, trustee of FH Europe and president of the Center for Innovation in Medicine in Romania. We'll start with a short presentation from MEP Cavallo and then have a conversation with Marianne, Birgit and Marius on the increasing emphasis on cardiovascular health at European level and what this might mean for FH pediatric screening in Europe. So the floor is yours, MEP Cavallo. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. As vice chair of the MEP Heart Group in the European Parliament, I would like to congratulate you on this important and very timely meeting. Only two weeks after we launched together the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health, I'm personally very committed to the need to prioritize cardiovascular diseases at European level as a highly neglected public health issue. The pandemic served to shine a very harsh and painful light on this issue. Colleagues in the European Parliament and I have called for more concerted research, innovation in, and investment for cardiovascular diseases. The human and financial burden of these diseases is enormous. Recent data from the Global Burden of Diseases database estimate that in the EU, more than 60 people live with CVD and that close to 13 million new cases of CVD occur every year. I do believe that we need to draw lessons from the excellence European Beating Cancer Plan and the Cancer Mission with the objective to do something similar in the future to really address the enormous societal challenge. I'm proud to support the newly established Cardiovascular Disease Alliance launched exactly two weeks ago that I will uh, spearhead progress in this area. This provides a wonderful backdrop for today's initiative on familiar hypercholesterolemia, pediatric screening. As you have heard from two mothers in France, this disease can have a catastrophic and fatal consequence if not detected early enough through pediatric screening and subsequent treatment. I congratulate Slovenia for providing a model and an inspiration to all of us, showing what is possible when the right conditions are in place. FH is a silence bomb for 90% of European citizens who go uh, diagnosed leading to premature heart attacks and deaths. And the silent bomb for many families that go on suffer psychological trauma and daily distress when we heard from Veronica and Charlotte. This is simply unacceptable in the third decade of the 21st century, when we know where and how progress can be made through comprehensive screening. I'm confident this meeting, gathering the foremost experts, scientists, policymakers, and patients will contribute to find the right solutions to address this really important problem. 
the evidence cannot be more obvious. And if we get it right on FH uh, pediatric screening, I am convinced that we can make similar inroads in other aspects of the CVD screening, drawing on lessons learned. I am keen to continue to support this cause beyond today's meeting. And I know my colleagues in the, in the MEP art group feel the same. And we commit to collaborating with all of you to make FH pediatric screening a reality for all we need across Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. A really critical message here is that we need to prevent the preventable. Birgit Bigger, a warm welcome to you today. Birgit, Maria referred to the launch of the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health, or EACH. What is the rationale behind this new alliance, which we know FH Europe is part of, and how can the alliance really support the call for FH paediatric screening in, in Europe? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to the meeting. Uh, thank you to, to, to Slovenia for giving such a good example and setting up a technical meeting to put FH screening further onto the agenda. Each, uh, the alliance was founded because um, different organizations, including mine, the European Heart Network, uh, were so aware and in pain, actually, because of the uh, burden, the, the health burden and the economic burden that cardiovascular disease is uh, bringing on to Europe, to Europe and worldwide, actually. So there was the, the need to, to, to do more about it and for tackling CVD at a more collective uh, level. And so as an alliance, uh, a multi-sectoral um, group came together for the first time ever. And that's been 15 leading European and international organizations. And they actually represent the full range of health sectors. There's a wealth of knowledge in cardiovascular health among us. And the, uh, the alliance represents tens of millions of patients, more than 200,000 health professionals, over 400 health technology companies, health insurers covering the medical costs of more than 200 million people. And of course, also millions of people living with genetic CVD risk factors, but who have not yet diagnosed yet. So we are actually committed to joining forces and sharing expertise to raise awareness of the burden of CVD on society, both for a European CVD plan to improve cardiovascular health, optimize quality of life in patients and undiagnosed citizens with CVD and prevent first and subsequent heart, and events, heart events and strokes. Then we also seek to advise policymakers on action to improve cardiovascular health and to prevent CVD in Europe, thereby making the population more resilient to future pandemics and other health threats. We also want to mobilize investment for CVD research because we are talking also innovation here and promote public-private partnerships and CVD innovation. So overall, we would like to see also to ensure a swift and equitable access to new medical technologies and medicines that add value to patients and society. So our main goal is really to have a European a CVD plan for health, a plan that doesn't fail and uh, it's the, a plan which we are discussing today at this meeting for FF screening presented by Slovenia. And we hope also then in future other uh, healthcare systems like France and uh, all over Europe will have a plan. And this plan will be integrated in this European CVD plan. And I have, um, I have very good news that the alliance of which FF Europe is part, uh, they immediately endorsed this event. And I think this is a very strong signal uh, of how the Alliance can work together and bring forward the cause of uh, CVD patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Birgit. A really amb ambitious, really exciting plan and a lot of solidarity there. Fantastic. So turning to you, uh, Marianne, where do you see the role of the European Commission in driving better outcomes for patients and citizens in the CV CVD space? And for FH paediatric screening from a public health perspective, where might the Commission be able to help? Yes, uh, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me to discuss these issues with you. And in fact, I would like to congratulate you and the Slovenian presidency in particular 
for organizing uh, this event. Um, I think Magdalena already mentioned that already before the pandemic, uh, cardiovascular diseases have been the leading cause of death globally. But in terms of the European Commission's role in this area or any other disease area or screening uh, in, in general, uh, I think you uh, may know that the member states of the European Union are, of course, in charge of organizing and, and funding the national health systems. So the, the role of the Commission is primarily to support the member states in their efforts to tackle uh, NCDs, uh, non communicable diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases, and uh, health in all policies, uh, which is also embedded in the Treaty of the EU, is our guiding principle in joining efforts um, to tackle this burden. Um, our focus uh, for the past few years has been on practical implementation. And it's not so much about preparing strategies and telling uh, others what to do, but to really identifying solutions to the member states that could be then implemented. And we believe that the implementation or uh, transfer of best practices is best done at the local or national level, grassroots level, rather than uh, at the EU level. Um, the Commission supports the transfer of best practices on health promotion and disease prevention. And uh, for example, in the areas of physical activity, nutrition, and addressing other risk factors, such as tobacco consumption, um, the work is also relevant for cardiovascular diseases. And a number of best practices addressing uh, such risk factors have already been transferred in many EU member states. For example, a, a European physical activity on prescription is a project uh, which takes forward uh, work where uh, GPs can prescribe sports or activity instead of medicines to patients with uh, cardiovascular diseases. This project is being transferred to 10 member states from Sweden. Um, another ongoing project, it's called Young 50, has the objective to adopt and export uh, a screening model on cardiovascular diseases developed in Italy to, uh, to four uh, EU member states, including Lithuania, Romania, Luxembourg and Spain. Um, of course, you are aware about the Europe Speaking Cancer Plan, and that addresses common risk factors for non communicable diseases. Um, smoking rates are still too high in Europe, and uh, as part of this work, we will also review the tobacco legislation, and that includes, for example, the tobacco taxation directive and uh, rules on cross-border tobacco purchases. And we will also uh, update the Council recommendation on smoke-free environments uh, in order to take account of new uh, or novel uh, tobacco-related products. Um, finally, you may know that uh, under the new funding program of the, uh, of the Commission, the EU for Health program, 20% uh, of the budget should be on health promotion and disease prevention. And this is very important message to everyone. It's a real game changer and a paradigm shift for the strong health, European Health Union um, that we are working on to build. And we believe that it brings possibilities to increase and strengthen um, this uh, development and exchange of best practices, uh, also to support networks of knowledge sharing and mutual learning, and to invest in capacity building actions. Um, so I think the role of the Commission is uh, pretty much in that nutshell. Now, as regards the pediatric screening, that was your second part of your question, Nicole, I think. Um, well, it is a member state competent, but uh, the good news is that um, we have received under the EU best practice portal uh, a best practice proposal on familial hypercholesterolemia. And that best practice has been identified something that we can take forward to the member states uh, in the context of the steering group on health promotion, disease prevention, and management of non communicable diseases. It is then up to the member states to see if they want to implement that practice. Um, I don't know, maybe I can stop there, Nicolai, if you have further questions.
That's great, Marianne. I think very, very clear messages around transfer of learning, sharing good practice and the supportive but supportive role that the Commission can play in encouraging member states um, on and you've given some very, very good examples. Turning now to you, Marius, where do you see um, you're an ambassador, an important ambassador for prioritising cardiovascular disease at European level and also accelerating innovation in all its guises to support cardiovascular health for Europe citizens. So tell us a little bit more about your journey, your thinking in terms of, of moving forward. Thank you so much, Nicola, and I'm very happy to be here, part of this very, very important meeting. Indeed, it's quite difficult to, to discuss now about innovation. It was easier eight years ago when I founded the Center for Innovation in Medicine. In the meantime, innovation became actually a buzzword, and uh, it's quite difficult to, to uh, capture the public attention when talking about innovation. But for citizens and for patients with cardiovascular diseases, talking about innovation, it's a duty, I think. It's a mission, and I think it's the only acceptable way forward, talking and then doing. In fact, what means by innovation in CVD? Let's consider the case of a person who goes to, to the hospital having a chest pain and a person that is diagnosed then with a heart attack. She or he is a young person is not overweight, uh, lives near a park, does not smoke, and consumes alcohol occasionally. In other words, that person comply with all or almost all recommendations for cardiovascular disease prevention. And yet that person suffered an early myocardial infarction that could potentially be prevented. This is the failure the failure of the classic one-size-fits-all model, which currently governs the field of primary, secondary, and tertiary cardiovascular disease prevention. So far, CVD is perceived as a lifestyle disease. Lifestyle factors, of course, are important, but has to be clear, clear that many cardiovascular conditions cannot be prevented because they are inherited, they are genetic diseases. The bio biological revolution, that is actually part of the fourth industrial revolution, now allows us to have a high definition of the cardiovascular diseases and also allow us to innovate in the management of cardiovascular diseases through a precision and more personalized approach. FH is a common life-threatening genetic condition, was already mentioned, that if untreated can lead to early heart, heart attacks. But for many years, actually, we had the tools to early detect, to diagnose, and to treat FH. But nine out of 10 FH cases are undiagnosed and, of course, are untreated. So I think it's time to actually to rethink or to reimagine or to reinvent the cardiovascular disease prevention, to move from this population model to a citizen or a patient-centric model, thinking, taking in, into consideration the individual risk factors and all determinants of health. It's time for real innovation. Uh, it is not the time, it's never the time for innovation for the sake of, of innovation, but innovation has to help us to prevent what can be prevented, as already mentioned, according to the scientific evidence that we have at the moment. Fantastic. And it's really interesting that you're looking at innovation, not only in the context of medicines innovation, but also systems and social innovation. Fantastic. Time is really rushing on, um, but I would like to go back to each of you. Mayan, very briefly, what would be one piece of advice you would wish to give the CVD community to ensure the burden of this disease or these diseases fully recognized and acted upon? Uh, thank you, Nicola. Very interesting to hear also from uh, Birgit and Marius uh, on their thinking. Well, I think that your community, CVD community, is, is already very active and you advocate very well uh, for more actions and, in fact, better actions than what, what we have uh, currently. Um, 
from my side, I cannot, of course, tell you what to do and how to do it. But I think uh, in terms of what the Commission can do, um, we have the funding possibilities for projects and we've tried to do that over the years. Uh, in 2021, we will fund two joint actions between the member states. One will be on diabetes type 2, uh, which is also relevant for cardiovascular diseases. And the other one is um, it's about uh, disease prevention or health promotion activities for marginalized groups. Um, so in terms of uh, advice, the key thing is not to focus on silos, not to look at specific or individual diseases. Um, we have so many different kinds of conditions and patient groups and stakeholders. And sometimes um, it's important to make sure that we have comprehensive or horizontal strategies and, and discussions and so on. And that's why we've tried to look at risk factors, common risk factors, which cover many different disease areas. So I think I would, um, as the final piece of advice, to um, ally with uh, like-minded uh, colleagues from, from different disease areas and to find synergies and find areas where you can work together. And of yeah. course, on the commission side, we can um, provide the health policy platform where you can liaise with the, with the other uh, stakeholder groups. Thank you very much, Marianne. And that points very clearly to the, the value of the Alliance. Back to you, Birgit. Look, we've talked about system readiness, we've talked about innovation, we've talked about unity and cohesion of the community. What else needs to happen in one sentence? Just elevate a pitch, let's say. Nicola, even one word, I think leadership. Leadership. We leadership. We need people stepping upwards and forwards and to bring on uh, what is there. You, you called the Alliance um, ambitious, but it's also uh, the challenge we are facing with the with the health burden on CVD, which we call uh, in an optimistic way. I think that's another word. It's important to be optimistic. We call it uh, Alliance for um, Cardiovascular Health. So we are already looking into the future of what we want to see. And I think uh, this is what we, we need. We need leadership, people taking on, being convinced, talking, uh, talk, not only talking, but also cooperating through, uh, throughout multi-sectors as the Alliance is aiming to do. And uh, uh, indeed an, an optimism uh, to really bring on a better future for our children and the children of our children. Great, thank you very much, Birgit. Marius, again, very, very briefly, we heard from Maria that FH paediatric screening could become a model in other areas of cardiovascular health. And I think both Marianne and Birgit's interventions have pointed a little bit in that direction as well. Just very briefly, what would be the prerequisites for this to happen? Yes, I think there are at least four factors that could enable FH pediatric screening and could help FH pediatric screening to become a model at the EU level. First of all, we have science on our side with all the evolutions in genetics and genomics and data and biopharma and so on. Second, we have, and we'll discuss today, many examples, I may say, from member states from Europe who already implement different types of screening for, pediat uh, for, for, uh, yes, for pediatric population. Thirdly, we have the opportunity actually brought by the pandemic to reconfigure the EU role uh, in health and also the design of the health system. And fourth, we already, as Mariana mentioned, we have um, in implementation, the EU beating cancer plan and the cancer mission that uh, could be examples we can learn from in the in the in the years to come. Thank you very much, Marius. A lot of very rich food for thought. Thank you all for your wonderful contributions. I think it's clear there is a, a new and vivid momentum at European level to really focus on cardiovascular health and the FH community is very much part of this and there are opportunities for collaboration with the European Commission as well. So thank you very much and now we're going to actually move to the global level, to a global perspective, to get an understanding of the global call to action on FH and the specific recommendation linked to screening and how this has been a real springboard for our work in Europe. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Samuel Gidding, who is also an FH Europe trustee and was the senior author for this global call to action and will give us a little bit of a flavor, a brief overview. 
Professor Gidding, Sam, the floor is yours also to introduce yourself a little further. Thank you, Mrs. Bedlington, Nicola, for the kind introduction. My name is Sam Gidding. I'm a semi-retired pediatric cardiologist and now a trustee of FH Europe and co-chair of the World Heart Federation International Working Group on Familial Hypercholesterolemia. I'm here to talk about the global call to action, which originated and was convened by the World Heart Federation and the FH Foundation in the United States to bring more awareness to familial hypercholesterolemia worldwide. What is familial hypercholesterolemia? It's an inherited genetic condition that causes very high cholesterol and early heart attacks. If you have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, you have one gene that raises your cholesterol dramatically typically well above five millimoles per liter or 190 milligrams per deciliter, you have at least a 50% chance of having a heart attack by age 60 if you're not treated. You can be treated effectively with drug treatment and as many as one in 250 people, one of every 250 people in the world has this gene. More rare is homozygous hypercholesterolemia about one in 300,000. Here you have two of these high cholesterol genes. Your cholesterol is extremely high, uh, typically well over 10 millimoles or 400 milligrams per deciliter. And a heart disease can begin in childhood and you do not generally have a good response to drug treatment. The male hypercholesterolemia runs in families. For a heterozygote who is shown by the half red identification in this picture, we have a grandparent who has FH, a child of this grandparent who has FH, and it's passed on to further generations. For a homozygote, there are two grandparents who each have the gene or heterozygotes, and they have one child who's a homozygote, and that homozygous child obligatorily passes FH on to all uh, their children. The one hypercholesterolemia is first brought to the world's attention in 1998 by a WHO consultation, uh, and this was to raise awareness about this condition. Roger Williams was the leader of this group, and there were many colleagues from around the world who brought attention to FH. However, despite the fact that the cause of FH led to a Nobel Prize, 20 years later, uh, not enough had changed. Though treatment had improved and genetic diagnosis was more available, it remains the most common life-threatening genetic condition. It's found around the world in all races and ethnicity. And most startlingly, nine out of 10 people born with FH remain undiagnosed and are at high risk for heart disease. Now, FH Foundation World Heart Federation convened two international meetings. These are all the countries and organizations represented to develop consensus reactions published in JAMA Cardiology two years ago. This led to the global call to action on FH. In the map, you see all the countries involved, including most of the European countries. 34 million people worldwide have FH. Recommendations related to raising awareness, the most crucial issue related to FH, because even over 60% of physicians aren't aware of FH to have advocacy for this condition, not just for political awareness, but to provide support for the many patients worldwide who are suffering with this condition. To screen, test, and diagnose for the condition, to treat FH, to guarantee care for the most severe form because this is a very rare and debilitating condition. Most important because it's genetic to develop family-based care plans, to continue research, and most importantly, implementation science research because we have the treatments, we just have to get them to the right people to fund FH registries so we can monitor FH care and to understand the value and cost of this treatment. Most of the medications are generic and are low cost. FH is underdiagnosed worldwide. This map based on the familial hypercholesterolemia studies collaborative information, our international registry, shows how underdiagnosed FH is worldwide. The pioneering program in the world, which you'll hear more about later, is the Netherlands. A second pioneering program in, is in Norway. In these countries, 30 to 50 to 70% of the people 
in the country have been diagnosed. However, in the rest of Europe, that figure is considered to be less than 1%. Overall worldwide, less than 10% of people are diagnosed. And for children, less than 5% are diagnosed because most children are diagnosed only if their parents are diagnosed. So not only does a parent have to be diagnosed, but that parent has to bring their child to medical attention to get the diagnosis. Most of these people also are not getting sufficient cholesterol-lowering medication. FH care is complex. These are the elements of an FH care model. It includes diagnosis, assessment, screening of relatives, performing the genetic testing, the clinical management and care. In severe cases, using new treatments and what's called apheresis. This care has to be organized and there has to be an organized approach to screening for FH to identify the many undiagnosed cases. These nine recommendations resonate highly with patients. This is unpublished data uh, from research that I personally am working on in the United States, which shows the importance of the screening, diagnosis, and treatment recommendation and family-based care to patients. We've interviewed over 75 patients who have FH, and their spontaneous comments, almost 100%, emphasize the importance of family-based care because people with FH look to their relatives for support, and they also look at the experience in their families. And they point to the urgent need for early diagnosis. Over half the people with FH are diagnosed after they've had their heart attack, and we know that if you begin treatment in childhood at age 10, you may never have to have a heart attack in your entire life. This is a modeling exercise as to the importance of lowering cholesterol early in life. On the far right in the green line is the general population, and that shows that the average person reaches the horizon where a heart attack could happen by about age 55 years. The more traditional risk factors you are, the earlier you reach that horizon and the more protective factors you have, the later it is. On the far left is the bar for homozygous FH, the most severe form of the condition. In this setting, children reach this horizon for having a heart attack by 12 and a half years. If you're a heterozygous FH, you reach it at 35 years. Now the light blue line shows that if you start treatment with a very high dose statins, a potent medication, you can attenuate that to 48 years. But if actually, if you start a low dose medication, you can actually return the person to the general normal population risk for a heart attack at age 55 years. And this has been shown and data on this will be presented later in the meeting. High dose statin, begun at earlier in life or intensification of treatment early in life may actually keep a person with FH heart disease free. How about the cost of such a program? Again, the Netherlands is the model for our knowledge about this condition and its impact on people's lives. This shows the cost to ICER for FH compared to other conditions where screening programs currently exist. These include cervical cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer. The cost of FH care is a fraction of the cost of these other high-risk conditions which are already screened for. And the frequency of the FH gene is much higher than the risk for many of these other conditions. In conclusion, what is the role of government in helping advocate and manage FH care? Well, we know from research around the world that all successful FH care models which have originated have relied upon government to be successful because of the complexity of the FH care model. We also know that a country specific approach is necessary. The best practices to deliver guideline based care are not known, but we do know that different models work better in each country. Government support is required for research and registry funding. Care must be scaled for resources available in high, middle, and low-income countries. And most important, for those most severely affected, government policy must guarantee care for these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. 
very strong messages consistent with what we've heard earlier, the crucial importance of screening, early diagnosis and family-based care and, of course, the vital role of government. Without further ado, let's hear about the Global FH Re Registry and the evidence on paediatric screening, which also paints a very interesting picture here in Europe. I'm delighted to welcome Kanika Darmiata from the ES FH Studies Collaboration. Kanika, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola, for the kind introduction, and I'm pleased to be here to present to you all on behalf of the FHSC. So it's well established that FH is a common condition with one person in every 311 individuals having FH. Now, this is the most comprehensive and contemporary estimate within the general population and was derived from over 7.3 million individuals. Now, based on the current population size in the European Union, there are potentially more than 1.4 million individuals with FH. And the estimates specific to countries within the European Union are shown on the map. So despite um, FH being a common condition, over 90% of those with FH are yet to be detected. So greater attention towards strategies to improve detection is warranted. And one of the key recommendations by the global FH community is the establishment of registries to understand the status of FH care worldwide and current practices and gaps so that we can begin to address these through data-driven approaches. But this is a visualization for illustrative purposes to highlight that whilst many initiatives on FH exist within and between countries, they largely operate in a siloed manner and the lack of an integrated approach has so far limited the public health strategies to tackle the global burden. So to have an integrated approach, the FH Studies Collaboration, or FHSE for short, was initiated in 2015 to bring together a consortium of worldwide FH cohorts and registries with a view to promote early diagnosis and more effective treatment of FH. And currently we have 67 countries participating in this initiative. Now, this is a busy slide, but what I want to bring to your attention is the process of how data from local sites within countries is collated by national investigators and is transferred to the FHSC data warehouse. Now, in here, all received data undergoes multiple checks and date and validation processes in order to harmonize and standardize the data into a single format to be able to produce reliable quantitative metrics with greater precision. So this has led to our first publication from the FHSC cohort registry on the adult population. And from the available data, we can see that the median age of being diagnosed with FH is in the mid 40s. And from the bar graph of the proportion of participants in the registry, we can see that 40.2% are being diagnosed at ages less than 40 years, and only 2.1% are being diagnosed at ages less than 18 years. So detection in childhood is low, and diagnosis is occurring late in life. Now, these findings are important to illustrate that if FH is not identified at earliest time points, such as during childhood, then many years elapse before FH is detected with missed opportunity of receiving appropriate treatment during these elapsed years. Now, this slide shows the prevalence of cardiovascular disease at entry into the registry. So when FH is detected, one in six adults have established cardiovascular disease, and in most cases, this is premature. Now, we know that non-index cases identified through cascade screening are younger and have less risk factors. However, but generally for cascade screening to be triggered, we are relying on an adult having a cardiovascular event in the first place in order to find others, i.e. the children, within the families. Here we see that within the registry, less than 3% of adults taking a lipid-lowering medication meet, only 3% meet the guideline recommended goal attainment. So not only are individuals being identified late in life, but are also not reaching treatment goals. Also, as LDLC is cumulative, this means that more aggressive treatment is required uh, the later an individual is found due to the accumulation of atherosclerosis or hardening of blood vessels. But if we identify early through active screening, then we can have the benefit of prescribing less aggressive treatments at, the, at later time points in an individual's life. So from the current cohort within the registry of over 66,000 individuals, there are over 10,000 children that have been diagnosed with heterozygous FH. And I will now present some preliminary data of the children data set within the registry. 
as you can see from the bar graph, that over 75% of children have been diagnosed through a genetic test, which has been initiated as part of cascade screening. And to the right of your screen on the bar graph, we see that over 11% are index cases, which means that these 11% have been found systematically, for example, by their age group and not through an event triggering the search. The majority, or 88%, are non-index cases and found via cascade screening as a result of the parent being diagnosed, most likely following a cardiovascular event. Now, in this slide, we see the uh, LDL cholesterol at entry into the registry for children, and we can see that the overall LDLC is 196 milligrams per deciliter. This is very high considering the normal healthy range is less than 110 in those without FH. But this shows the importance of detecting early to initiate treatment at the beginning of the disease so that we can reduce the hardening of blood vessels or atherosclerosis, but also encourage healthy habits to enable a life course that is free of cardiovascular events. So given the world, current world population of 7 billion, there are between 25 to 35 million individuals with FH, of which more than 1.4 million are in the European Union. We have seen that diagnosis of FH is occurring late in life where cardiovascular disease is already established and is often the trigger for testing in children. We also see that children have high LDLC from a young age but are not receiving treatment. Screening actively for FH in childhood has substantial public health benefits, not least because you can identify their parents before they have a cardiovascular event, but also that if we identify early, then we can treat early to reduce the LDLC to a normal range and prevent development of atherosclerosis and enable a life course that mirrors the general population. These are my acknowledgements and I thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Kanika. This was a really, really very, very interesting and very telling presentation. Uh, your takeaway messages were, were so clear, but also you came brought across the importance of, of registries per se, bringing the evidence, bringing the data, but also the need for an integrated approach across the globe. So thank you very much for this. We're now going to have a short coffee break, a little shorter than anticipated because of a couple of little technical difficulties, but I would like to have you all back by 14.20 at the latest because we'll be kicking off with the next session, which will explore screening programmes throughout the European Union and some really excellent best practices. Enjoy your little break and see you back here at 20 past two, 14.20. Thank you very much.
So welcome back from the break. So far this afternoon, we've heard about the realities of living with FH, the significant unmet need regarding FH pediatric testing, the wider landscape as CVD evolves as a new priority, cardiovascular health, and how the global community came together to advocate for recognition of FH as a serious public health issue requiring a strong policy response and of course the fundamental role of registries. This session will home in on the European Union and will explore how different countries are approaching FH paediatric screening, where good practice exists and why and how progress could actually be speeded up, be accelerated. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Uwe Groschel, scientific advisor to FH Europe, to present an overview of the state of play across Europe, a helicopter vision, and then to share us, with us the approach in Slovenia, which is widely acknowledged as, as first in class. You'll then kindly introduce colleagues from other member states to share their experiences. Professor Groschel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola, for uh, introduction. And uh, good afternoon and kind regards to all the participants of our meeting. Uh, today, in my first uh, talk, I will discuss the FH screening programs in the Europe. So, um, as it was previously stressed, um, FH is uh, severely um, underdiagnosed despite it's the most frequent life threatening metabolic disorders in humans. Solely in Europe, um, over 2 million people um, are affected, and there are very few countries where detection rates are over 10%. So we can say that over 90% of all people with FH is currently still undiagnosed also in Europe. The recent Lancet Global Registry results emphasize the need for early detection of FH already in childhood. So childhood offers several opportunities for um, effective FH screening. It offers best discrimination of monogenic and multifactorial hypercholesterolemia. In most countries, there are some population-wide preventive or healthy children visits. There is a good possibility of early lifestyle and therapeutic interventions that uh, if we want to last, uh, later on should be introduced in childhood. And there is easy to add child sibling or child parent FH screening. And of course, having a healthy parent is a child uh, very best interest. So by FH screening, it's possible to impact in a favorable way the CVD risk profile of the whole family. And what are the data for Europe? Uh, based on our global FH screening, survey, there are um, several countries in Europe with implemented nationwide cascade screening, most notably the Netherlands, um, the Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway, um, Austria, uh, the Czech Republic. But on the other hand, there are very few countries with um, introduced universal screening. Slovenia has it as a nationwide program, and there are some pilot programs running in Czech Republic, Slovakia, and there are some regional based programs in Germany currently and in Greece. There is also a divide in Europe regarding the percentage of children with access to cholesterol measurements. In several countries, it is a great majority of children with access to cholesterol measurement, but in the others, relatively few children have access to cholesterol measurement. Also, with regard to access to genetic testing in children, there is quite a variety of situations in Europe. In some countries, it's available, but in the others, not. In general, we can claim that great majority of countries have at least uh, some kind of um, organized program, healthy visits in, during childhood, um, several of them during uh, many different time points. And these healthy program visits offer a good opportunity for um, FH screening if we want to do it universally. Recently, best practices were recognized by the public health best practice portal by the European Commission on pediatric FH screening. 
And there are some most prominent programs listed in the portal as best practices, which is a very good basis for potential uh, generalization of these programs throughout the Europe. So what are the barriers to screening implementation in Europe? Uh, the most important barriers perceived based on our global effort survey is lack of financial resources, lack of support by government, lack of institutional support, and that FH is currently not a healthcare priority in a country. So to conclude, FH should be screened, and the optimal model depends on the healthcare system of country of particular conditions in each country. In EU, few existing FH screening cascade and universal programs already exist, and several more pilot programs are already taking place. Cholesterol measurement is frequently available to children in you, but somewhat less available is genetic testing. And in majority of countries, a population-wide program visits of children do exist, which are a good basis to potentially add also the FH universal screening at that point. What are the main barriers? The major uh, perceived was a lack of financial resources. The others were lack of support by government or their institution, and that FH is currently not a healthcare priority. And recently, uh, best practices in FH screening were recognized by the European Commission and are now available to be potentially generalized throughout the Europe. In this um, speak, I will talk about the universal f screening program in Slovenia. So Slovenia is currently one of the very few countries with kind of universal nationwide program. And um, there are a few pilot universal programs existing, for example, in Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, or a few institutional based or regional uh, universal screening programs. Most of them are also uh, on a pilot basis. Slovenia is a small country in Central Europe with 2 million people. It has around 20,000 newborns annually um, and two university medical centers. We have a network of around 500 pediatricians and a strong primary care pediatricians association. And uh, in addition, we have one pediatric lipid clinic and one lipid genetic lab. Both are at the University Children's Hospital, Ljubljana. In Slovenia, as legally required, there are frequent program preventive visits at primary pediatricians. So typically child by the age of five years would see his or her pediatrician for 10 times, which is also the basis for cholesterol measurement at the age of five. So we have a three-step approach of F8 screening. The first step is universal cholesterol screening at the primary care level. The second step is genetic F8 screening at the tertiary level. And the third step is child parent screening at the tertiary level. We have a detailed screening algorithm which allows to um, specifically address all the situations within this screening program. As a first step, there is a universal total cholesterol measurement at the primary care pediatricians at the age of five years. This is prior to entry to school. If the total cholesterol is above five millimoles per liter, retesting is ordered. If the total cholesterol is about six millimoles per liter or about five millimoles per liter plus positive family history, the child is referred to the tertiary lipid clinic. This algorithm is also detailed and available to all the primary care algorithm to act in the same fashion. So the, the frequency distribution of cholesterol levels in our population shows a long tail on the right side uh, where most of the heterozygous FH patients are concentrated, but there is also a relatively 
substantial overlap between heterozygous FH and polygenic hypoglycemia. And these cases are, are also detected by our screening program. In 2014, a pilot assessment was performed and showed that over 91% of five-year-olds had actually tested total cholesterol and 0.7% of them had total cholesterol levels about six millimoles per liter. As a second step, we have a genetic F8 screening at our lipid clinic at the University Children's Hospital Ljubljana. We assembled a NGS panel uh, comprised of three F8 genes plus 15 other genes. And by our program, we thus detect also different types of rare dyslipidemias which are associated with elevated cholesterol. We published before some analysis from the program in, in recent years. First showed that over 50% of all referred patients had confirmed FH, but in more recent years, this percentage is around 40 or 45% due to um, higher referral rate. And then we have also um, a bit more of FH negative patients referred. But up to mid 2021, we altogether performed over 1,500 genetic analysis, and approximately one in 400 of total yearly birth cohort of children are confirmed FH, either genetically or clinically. So um, there is a quite um, big overlap between the FH positive cases and FH negative cases. And also our population has quite a lot of APOB positive patients. But uh, on the whole, um, we have with a population of 2 million people, around 220 FH positive uh, kids in our pediatric registry per 1 million. The sensitivity of LDL 3.5 millimoles per liter threshold is 85.2% and specificity 61.1%, uh, which means that there is actually also quite substantial detection of polygenic cases if we want to detect majority of monogenic cases. As a third step, we have a child parent uh, which is also called reverse cascade screening. So each child has one parent with FH, uh, which was confirmed in 94% of children in our cohort. And three quarters of the parents were not on the therapy, and most of them didn't know that they have elevated cholesterol. Dire costs of the program were around 850 euros per one genetically confirmed FH patient detected. To conclude, Slovenian model of universal FH screening, which is three-step approach, is feasible in practice. We confirmed FH in approximately one in every 400 children born in Slovenia in the recent years. To have a fully functional program, it's important to establish a national or regional reference pediatric lipid clinic and also referral genetics lab. Very important is a good collaboration with primary care level, especially in, with primary care pediatricians, but also in some uh, systems uh, GPs. Important is to establish FH registry and to support patient initiatives. And also important is a good transition in care, so good collaboration with adult physicians, not to lose the many benefits with early screening. By doing universal type of screening, you also detect many polygenic hypercholesterolemia patients and some secondary disorders. Uh, and uh, every screening program needs to be prepared to that. So thanks a lot for your attention. As a next speaker, I would like to introduce Professor Albert Wigman from Amsterdam. Albert doesn't need special introduction. He's one of the giants in the field. 
and actually directly responsible that many children are diagnosed and treated in time. Thank you, Mr. Groschel, and thanks for the invitation to share three decades of experience in children and adolescents with familial hypercholesterolemia in the Netherlands, the cascades procedures. Why screening of children with heterozygous at age? Is heterozygous at age in childhood a disease or a disorder? I can tell you it's a disaster. And that's all due to the fact that the parents already got their first infarction with a mean age of 38, one in three. And if they die, one in four, they die at a mean age of 41. So it's a terrible experience for the children. If you have homozygous FH, you have real high LDL between 13 and 30, and it can give the heart attack between the age of two and a half and six year old. Whereas in heterozygous of age, your LDL is between four and 10, and it can give the heart attack between 25 and 60 year old. And what we extra experienced is that during 1989 till 2020, we divided the group in three, and you see still the mean age of CVD is around 38 all over the 22 years, but the percentage that a heart attack occurred was in the beginning one in three, later on one in four, and finally one in six. So that's achievement. And the death is still around the 40s, but it experienced one in eight, later on one in 20, and nowadays one in 30 people die from their FH at a young age due to the screening. We started our outpatient ward in 1989 and almost 4,000 children were referred. Every year, 120 newly referred children with of age to our lipid clinic and yearly 250 newly diagnosed children with of age. This is something, but still not enough because we now know that per year, 700 children are born with of age in the Netherlands. The cascade screening started with a group who went to families trying to get a good pedigree, hopefully this type of pedigree, but actually it was more this type of a pedigree, but it helped. The same happened in Norway. We figured out who was suffering from FH and who could be treated at an early age, whereas other countries in 2013 were not uh, starting. One thought we were almost there, but we now know it more than doubles in the society. It's one in 244 instead of one in 500. So the frequency is this high and the loss of life expectancy is 21 years. The mean age in the Netherlands is 82. In this group with heterozygous of age, it's 61. And, and now we know it's 70,000 people in the past, it was thought 35,000. And when we were uh, at 30,000, the minister stopped the cascade screening and 40,000 were not identified. The number dropped enormously to, let's say, 22% from the past and 42% found and 58% lost. It's easy to see if a child is having FH or not. The unaffected siblings have 2.5 millimol LDL and the heterozygous more than double. Should we prevent them? Yes, we should start prevent them from not smoking and introduce a lot of exercise like biking or other types of exercise. Introduce at an early age statins between eight and 18 years, and almost all children finished a two year trial with pravastatin versus placebo. It was excellently tolerated and was safe. And we performed ultrasounds um, on a yearly basis. And already after two years, there was a significant difference between placebo, where the IMT, the thickness of the carotid artery increased, whereas it was a regression in the PRAFA treated group. So fat can come out of the vessel wall and it can prevent that it becomes calcified. And this is the slide after 20 years of follow-up. We published this 
where the parents started their drug at the age of 30 and almost 40% had their heart attack before the age of 40 and 11 already died of the 156 parents before the age of 40. None of the children died. One had a stent who stopped his drug at 18. Luckily, final slide, there is improvement of detection in the Netherlands again, but we are not on that level what we had before 2013. We now go in the direction of 800 people per year, partly one in three index and two in three screened. Thank you for your attention. And may I pass the word on to Mr. Freiberg. Thank you very much, Professor Wigman, but it's a pleasure to be here to provide some insights on the Czech Republic and developments here in the context of FH screening and particularly FH pediatric screening. We have three screening strategies to diagnose FH. These are opportunistic and cascade testing, selective screening, and newly the pilot project of the universal screening in newborns. Opportunistic testing detects FH patients by routine healthcare procedures done from any reason. The patients with suspicion of FH are then referred to our specialized MedPet centers, and those fulfilling FH diagnostic criteria are put into the database and cascade testing in families follows. At this moment, I should mention what the MedPet project is. It's an acronym for Make Early Diagnosis to Prevent Early Death in Medical Pedigrees. Our country joined the project in 1997, and it has been running under the umbrella of the Czech Atherosclerosis Society. The main goal is to identify FH patients as early as possible, to start treatment as early as possible, to prevent premature death and non-fatal heart attacks in these high-risk individuals. A key point for method success is a network of collaborating centers, which are spread over the whole country. We have 68 sites, two national centers, a number of regional centers and specialized clinics. Where possible, we have established a pediatric center paired with the adult one. We have 18 pediatric centers altogether. Since 1997, the number of FH patients evidenced in the nationwide database has been gradually increasing, and we have detected almost 8,900 FH patients so far. Considering the prevalence 1 to 250, the expected number of FH patients in the Czech Republic is almost 43,000. It means that we have identified 21% of all FH individuals expected to be in Czech Republic, including 647 children. Although the Czech Republic belongs to the most successful countries globally in terms of the relative number of diagnosed FH cases, still there are more than 30,000 FH individuals who have not been diagnosed and treated. Another screening strategy is a selective screen. There is a mandatory cholesterol testing in children aged 5 and 13 in case of premature cardiovascular event in their familial history. This is done by primary care pediatricians as a part of preventive examinations. I should say that the selective screening is a part of reimbursed care. However, the data on how this program is effective is lacking. Now I would like to introduce our pilot project of the universe screening from umbilical blood, which we call CHECK-IN, an acronym for Czech cholesterol in newborns, which includes also a pun referring to the Czech environment. The project with the support from the European Union has already been initiated. We plan to measure bad LDL cholesterol in 10,000 neonates and perform molecular genetic testing in those with LDL cholesterol above the level of 85th percentile. We are aware of the fact that LDL cholesterol examination for diagnosing FH is the most sensitive and specific when done between one and nine years of age. However, it showed a reasonable sensitivity and specificity also in umbilical blood. And what is a big advantage of this approach? 
umbilical blood is more easily available sample than any other blood sample later in life. Aims of the project are to determine umbilical blood LDL cholesterol sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing FH, to find the most effective combination of biochemical and molecular testing for diagnosing FH in neonates, to find out if neonatal testing is a feasible approach for universal screening at the population level. We expect to find 400 newborns with FH, and by reverse cascade testing in their families, we expect to find additional at least 400 of each individuals in this project. And the main goal, of course, is to make check-in of all newborns with FH already at birth, and thus to ensure all children with FH a cardiovascular event-free flight through their lives this way. Thank you very much for your attention. It gives me great pleasure to give the floor to Professor Noel Peretti from France, to share with you some of the challenges and opportunities in FH pediatric screening in France. Professor Peretti, Noel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Freiberger, for inviting me. Yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here, to home in on France and the current state of play regarding FH pediatric screening. Uh, I'm Professor Noel Peretti, in charge of the Department of uh, Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition in Lyon. The French guidelines for screening uh, go back 10 years. They recommend systematic screening for children between three and nine. Unfortunately, as you will see, the implementation is still quite poor. What is the French context for familial hypercholesterolemia? France has a large FH population. FH is a frequent disease that affects over 50,000 children in France. The FH National Registry called Refercol was started in 15. About 20 centers actively participate to the recruitment of nearly 8,000 patients, actually, including about 500 children who account for 1% of the theoretical FH pediatric population in France. Even though all FH uh, diagnosed children are not be included in this registry, it seems reasonable to suppose that the majority of FH children diagnosed in France are recorded in this registry, which is completed by the main expert centers of the country. Then the estimated FH screening in France is very low, between one to 10%, as reported in literature for other European countries. Furthermore, in this registry of specialized centers, only half of the children are treated. Why is the national recommendation for universal screening so poorly implemented? We can identify three main reasons. First, insufficient training of primary care physicians, I mean pediatricians and general practitioners who know little about the disease and guidelines as well as insufficient information to the population to increase awareness of this frequent, severe, but silent disease. Second, difficulty to obtain blood sample as parents are often reluctant to, to accept a blood function for a young and healthy child. And last but not least, in France, we do not have a specific health organization to deal with this disease systematic screening, for example, dedicated consultation and centralized specialized centers are unfortunately still far too rare. How can we address this serious public health issue? Recently, Annette, uh, the French Association of uh, FH patients, including a panel of medical FH experts, contacted the French Ministry of Health to address this, this issue. We suggested collaboration and such solutions. As a result, two working sessions were organized. The French project has two main objectives. First, to develop universal screening uh, in young children during targeted medical visit at two years over mandatory examination or at six years during school medical checkup. As demonstrated by uh, Professor Ward, these are ideal timings to detect both children and young parents who might also be prone to cardiovascular events later in life. This reverse screening seems a realistic and uh, efficient strategy to detect both uh, children and parents. 
to overcome parents' reluctance to draw blood, we plan to use dried blood tests, which are less invasive and uh, easier to perform. Second, in order to uh, run a successful screening program, it is absolutely necessary to implement also an educational strategy. Therefore, we should aim at reaching out to primary care physicians to educate them about the disease, its treatment, and the follow-up, but also as well as implementing a public awareness campaign targeting the general populations. So in conclusion, with uh, its large children population suffering from familial hypercholesterolemia, France has a duty to address it, create and implement an efficient health policy. We absolutely need to identify patients with fight and fight this serious disease, which heavily impacts so many young adults uh, while informing about the affordable and effective treatments that are available. It's our duty to implement the best practices available in screening and treatment to save those children who are future young adults with high cardiac risk. So in one word, time has come to act in France. Thank you for your attention. Uh, now I am uh, handing back over to Mrs. Bellington, who will introduce the next, the next uh, speaker. Over to you, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel, Noel Peretti. A really powerful statement from him on the imperative really to act. So what should happen now? What are the recommendations from the FH community on moving forward? We're going to hear from Pr Professor Albert Wiegmann again, and he'll share the collective thinking from the FH scientific, uh, scientific advisory body which is actually built on these country level examples that we've just listened to very carefully. Albert, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mrs. Bellington. And um, I would like to talk to you about the action plan for of age pediatric screening in Europe. Already in 2013, a group of um, European Atherosclerosis Society performed a consensus statement, familial hypercholesterolemia is underdiagnosed and undertreated in the general population. Guidance for clinicians to prevent coronary heart disease. But even eight years later, a few weeks ago, in the Lancet publication, there was a study performed in 42,000 adults from 56 countries with the following conclusion. FH is still diagnosed late, median age 44. B, the guideline of LDLC is infrequently achieved with single drug therapy. And furthermore, the presence of coronary disease were lower amongst screened cases who were diagnosed earlier. And earlier detection and greater use of combination therapies are required to reduce the global burden of FH. There is a burden of FH. If you look at the European region, 1.8 million up till 4.5 million. For the European Union, it's between one and two and a half million people, depending on one in 500 or one in 200. In the past, it was assumed one in 500 and everybody was applauding for Norway and the Netherlands, but we now know it's much more frequent. And there is still a lot to do because familial hypercholesterolemia in children and adolescents will give decades of healthy life years by optimizing detection and treatment. And FH is not rare. Here you see the Duchenne cystic fibrosis, neurofibromatosis, Huntington disease, sickle cell disease, all very known, but this is FH, the huge column. And two recent publications within one week show that the frequency of heterozygous of age worldwide is one in 300, 311 up till 330, was done in meta-analysis of 7 million and of 11 million people. So this means for the European Union, around 300,000 children with of age and 1.2 million adults with of age, and at yet less than 10% are discovered 
homozygous at age is a chapter uh, on its own. Four-year-old boy who died in kindergarten with a very high cholesterol on atorvan ezetimibe died suddenly at the age of four, and there was 98% occlusion of the left coronary artery. Only 2% left where all the blood had to go through. These signs of orange-like eruptive xanthomas are for opportunistic screening. You should know this is homozygous at age and should start or apheresis or other types of drugs we recently published in the upper part, you see the, the plaques in orange, and after one and a half year treatment, the plaques were gone. So fat can come out of the vessel wall and it can't become calcified. That's the whole idea about early detection and treatment. Why screening of children with heterozygous at age? Heterozygous at age in childhood causes an 11 fold increased risk of heart attack in men and even a higher risk, 17-fold increased risk of heart attack in women between the age of 25 and 40. The former was from Norway, this is from the United States. Compared to a normal LDLC and no mutation associated with the age, those with high LDLC, above five, and no mutation have a six-fold increased risk of heart attack and stroke, whereas those with high LDLC and the mutation have a 22-fold higher risk because it starts at birth. Here is what it's all about. This is the back years, not of cigarettes, but of cholesterol. Unaffected individuals cross a line, let's say at the age of 70, then the heterozygous already, heterozygous of age cross that line at 35 and homozygous at the age of seven. So if we do ultrasounds uh, routinely, and we compare the non-FH with heterozygous FH, the non-FH have a thickness of the IMT of 0.8 millimeters at the age of 80, but heterozygous has this already at the age of 40, before the age of 40. And you can bend the line by starting drug treatment at 30, you bend it a bit, you start at 20, you bend it even more, you start at 15, even better. But nowadays we believe as soon as possible, lower the cholesterol and you have the same line as the unaffected siblings. And this is shown in the 20 years follow-up children with of age versus parents with of age. I already showed you uh, about the Dutch experience. What we published in New England is that the parents started at the age of 30, and 40% had their heart attack before the age of 40. And 11 died before that age of the 156 parents. Whereas the children, none of them died. One got a stent at the age of 28 because he stopped his drugs at 18. Family history of premature cardiovascular disease plus high LDLC are the two key selected screening criteria. F plus H is FH. Twice an LDL above five is highly probable of age. Twice above four and premature early cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, highly probable. Twice above 3.5 and a genetic diagnosis in the parent, highly probable and proven pathogenic mutation in the child is definite of age. So this is a flow diagram. You can enter via the child or via the parent and you know if it's needed to treat. And it is highly cost effective. We compared FH screening with colon cancer, breast cancer, and cervix cancer. And it's a cost effective way of screening. So the main recommendations extracted from the action plan, every European country should have a familial hypercalcemia, early detection screening, diagnosis, and care program focused on childhood identification and treatment, building on existing good practices and proud partnerships. Two, screening programs should include a combination of cascade, universal, and opportunistic strategies based on cholesterol testing, that's fine, FH genetic testing, or ideally a combination and occur during regular healthcare visits, community settings, or perinatal period. And finally, three, the government healthcare budgets should support investment in uptake of relevant best practice models from other countries, developing a European network of exchange 
and shared learning. And finally, research to support childhood FH identification should include registries documenting FH care and to monitor progress and health outcomes. Thank you for your attention and back to Nicola. Thank you very much, Albert. You've outlined a really clear draft blueprint for moving forward. And now is the moment to glean the views of other key stakeholders at the forefront of cardiovascular health. We are very honored that Professor Lale Togosogulu, past president of the European Atherosclerosis Society, has agreed to moderate this session. And I would like immediately to give the floor to her. Lale, please. Thank you very much. So welcome to the panel on FH screening in Europe, where we will move towards a consensus with the key stakeholders. We've been discussing that FH is vastly underdiagnosed and undertreated, leading to early cardiovascular events. And since WHO recognized it as a public concern, there have been positive efforts from different stakeholders and a call to action was published last year with International Coalition. But now is the time to come together for a systematic approach in Europe to preserve the health of future generations. Today, we have distinguished representatives from the key stakeholders. Uh, joining us today is uh, Professor Kasi Cray, president of the European Atherosclerosis Society, Professor Raul Santos, president of International Atherosclerosis Society, Professor Fausto Pinto, president of World Heart Federation, Professor Martin Halle, President of the Prevention Association of the European Society of Cardiology, and Dr. Gutierrez Ibarluzia, WHO Technical Advisory Group and past President of Health Technology Assessment. So without further ado, I'd like to start our panel. And the first question I want to discuss is by hearing the panelists' perspectives on the importance of screening programs. And I'd like to give the floor first to Professor Ray, because he has uh, published the world's largest registry on FH. Please. Thanks, Professor Tokazoglu. So I think what we've done with the global registry, the first aim was to try and understand this is a genetic condition. We've got a fairly good understanding of the prevalence, one in 311 globally. In certain regions of the world, it's more frequent where there's consanguineous marriages and so forth. But the, the key message is that if you look at a condition that occurs in every WHO region of the world, it's diagnosed after 45 years of exposure have been missed. That's the average age at which we are diagnosing these individuals. Moreover, when you look at the age of diagnosis, the later the age of diagnosis, the more likely it is that people have had something bad happen to them, whether it's a heart attack, a bypass operation, a procedure. And these are only the people that have survived long enough to be able to get into the registry and doesn't even include those that have died before. Very few children are identified early on. So if you look at people before the age of 20, less than in our global registry, less than 2% are in that particular category. The next important thing about this is we lose the opportunity to change behaviors and reduce the likelihood of additional risk factors developing. Because yes, the main driver for heart disease will be high cholesterol present from birth. But the later the age of diagnosis, the more common are additional things like high blood pressure, like diabetes, like higher weight. That basically means those 40 years where you've got a very good opportunity to course correct, not only to start cholesterol lowering treatment, but to encourage lifestyle behaviors is lost. If you look at those people in our registry now who were identified because their family member was identified, because the age of those additional people is, is lower, there is less likelihood of cardiovascular disease and also risk factors. So we know that actually identifying people means that they are less likely to have things wrong with them, less likely to have risk factors. So what that consistency of that message is telling you is time. 
If you now move to the children, and you've seen this already, that of the global data that we now have, like 200, uh, sorry, 12,000, 13,000 or so individuals, the vast majority are found as by uh, index, as an index case, meaning that something bad had to happen to their mother or their father for them to be found. And that is morally wrong. We should be finding people systematically in a way that we can change their life course and through reverse cascade testing, maybe also help their parents. And we often think about these things like screening and identifying, thinking that, you know, it's, it's going to be a budget item. It's going to be a cost. If we are really to be serious about preventing this condition and its consequences, we need to think about preserving health and not treating disease, which is what currently we're actually doing. So with that, Lali, I will hand back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to have the perspective of uh, Professor Santos, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to meet you all. So as, as has been shown before, we have a condition that is genetically determined that we can make early diagnosis. We can implement efficacious, safe, and cheap therapy, and we can make a lot of difference. So in my opinion, uh, if Europe starts really this process of making pediatric diagnosis as, let's say, a rule. And Europe can be an example to the rest of the world. I represent a society that actually focuses mostly on the health uh, of people outside developing regions. So uh, outside, sorry, developed regions. So I, I, I think that if we learn from what is being proposed here and we can expand this with simple measures, I think we can make a lot of difference. As, as Professor Ray showed, the registry shows a really a huge gap in different areas of the world. And certainly in, in, in countries like mine, uh, we have a greater gap. So basically, we have to learn from the examples that have been shown and really expand the possibility of really making the difference. And, and as I said, the therapies for most of people with FH, it's it's been already uh, uh, with us for more than 30 years. They are safe and they are cheap. They're inexpensive and they can make a lot of difference and, and really save lives, save costs. So I think this is the example that must be set for the rest of the world to really make the difference for all of us and especially for our children. And, and definitely I think we will change the face of this disease forever if we're able to start very early. Thank you very much for the possibility of being here. Thank you. I certainly hope so, Rao. Uh, Kosh, uh, did you want to add something? Yeah, so I really want to echo those last sentiments. So I made the point about thinking about investment and thinking about this as, as, a, as an opportunity to basically prevent and invest and get a return in the future. The one way to think about this is, if you find people age 40, 50, 60, think about this as pension and when you are going to retire. If I've never saved my entire life and I start to think that in 10 years I'm going to retire, to retire with a good pension, I'm going to have to put a lot of money away at that point. So basically all those people that we find much later in life, we often think about, well, am I going to be using lots and lots of expensive drugs and treatment? you find people late, then you probably will have to, to course correct. But if you start early, it's like saving for a pension very early on. The early you start, and we have cheap, small treatment, you will get that compound interest so that you can retire in good health. That was the only thing I wanted to add, Lalette, which I forgot. That's a very important point. And now uh, the perspective of WHF is, of course, extremely important. So. I'd like to hear from uh, Professor Pinto, his perspective. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Lali, and uh, good afternoon uh, to all the panel and the audience. And it's really been a fantastic day. Um, I think we have to congratulate the Slovenian presidency for putting together this uh, important meeting. And as uh, Sir Geoffrey Rose said many years ago, it's very important that whatever we do in the medical field or whatever we do in the scientific field that reaches out to the decision makers because at the end 
if the governments, if the ones who have to decide are not aware and are not uh, uh, sensitive enough for this type of uh, issues, nothing will happen. We've had many documents, we've had many calls to action, and uh, we really need here to have the engagement of who has to decide uh, based on the evidence. We have enough evidence today to move forward. Uh, today, we've seen several uh, uh, presentations, uh, and we just saw very important ones that give us all the evidence that we need to move forward for a strategy uh, that uh, should include the early detection. It's clear now, there is no question about it. It saves lives. So it's a call to action now to save lives and save lives of children. And this is something that has to be highlighted. And you just saw the numbers. It's, uh, uh, it's appalling. We are basically, by not doing the right thing, and by only having like 10% of people uh, diagnosed, we are actually letting our children die. And that's not good, of course. I think everybody will agree with that. So it's, it's really important that as we as medical community and scientific community that actually see when things go wrong and uh, develop the science that can then be used to base on important decisions, what we can do here is actually to show very clearly what can happen if the, the measures that need to be put in place are not done appropriately. It's very important that now uh, within the EU, there is this, this sort of consensus. And uh, I think, and we saw presentations from different countries, and although there are still some uh, inequalities among the different European countries, but I, I hope that this will be a very important uh, push forward in terms of having a more homogeneous approach at European level. But not only that, and as my colleagues just mentioned, it's very important that these, I would say, simple measures to do this as we do today for some other diseases, uh, I think it's clear that the early detection of uh, FH should be like we do for hypothyroidism or for other conditions uh, that are then uh, in the newborn. And, very nice experiences were uh, shown and examples were shown here, still very small. And that's what we have to do now. We have to make this big. So we have to make this big on one hand, the news that should reach the decision makers. And it seems that it's, it's reaching there. And then make sure that from an operational standpoint, this can be done at the global level from low, middle and high income countries. It's very important for the future of uh, our community. It's very important for the future of these people. Uh, Professor Ray just mentioned the, the and, and I used this comparison also of the pension. If we, if we, all of us trying to save some money for uh, when we are older, come on, here we're dealing with children and uh, we're dealing with uh, the opportunity to not, you know, the, an old concept that no one should be left behind. Mm -hmm. And I think we all agree with that. Uh, WHF has been doing its, uh, uh, its share. Uh, many of you and many of the organizations represented here are members of uh, uh, WHF. There have been some important documents. There was an important document, a couple of a call to action actually, organized a couple of years ago with the uh, FH Foundation. We've been also working with FH Europe which is a member of WHF. We've been working with many of our other members. There is now, we, uh, we have at WHF organized what we call the roadmaps. And there is a, a roadmap on cholesterol, which is being updated. And actually Professor Ray and Professor Santos are the co-chairs uh, for this roadmap. And uh, I can only hope that all these messages, and that's why this me meeting is important because it's, only among, it's not only among doctors or among health professionals. It's also uh, including uh, many other players and particularly the decision makers. So I hope this can make a difference uh, for, the, for the future of, uh, of these people and basically for the future of all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'd like to echo your sentiments. I hope today is the day we go forward. Now, another major stakeholder is the European Society of Cardiology. So I'd like to ask Professor uh, Halle about uh, his uh, perspective. La, 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 dear colleagues, uh, uh, thank you for this uh, this great uh, initiative and uh, also for the, uh, the uh, presentations. The only question I have is why the stakeholders go out and do it? Why have you waited? Why are you waiting? The evidence is so clear. It is so simple to go for this to save lives as uh, Professor Fausto Pinto pointed out, save lives of children who in 
politics, who in governance has the opportunity to save lives by action taken. So I just want to say from the European Society of Cardiology and Preventive Cardiology, just do it. Why don't you do it? Just do it uh, and go for it. I certainly hope so. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I also want to hear from uh, Dr. Gutierrez Giberluze about what he thinks. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and also thank you very much uh, for this initiative. That is, um, I think it is uh, very on time. So um, uh, Professor Halle was, was saying why we are not doing. I think it is quite, quite clear why we are not doing. First of all, because uh, no governments have decided to go ahead. Probably one government as a, as a single voice would have said, we will go ahead and, and do it. Uh, probably that will be also an echo in different governments all over the world, especially high income countries. The second thing it is, we are talking about the uh, saving lives, lives of children, but in reality, it is making an action that will be, um, the results will be in the future. It will, it will not be immediately. So we need to think about the politicians that they need to uh, uh, make the investments and they wanted to achieve those um, uh, actions and, and those uh, outcomes to be measured in less than four or five years. One of the problems with uh, most of these screen tests, it is that we, we test now and we have the results in 20, 30 years, at least in most of the cases. If it would, would be to have an, um, an action that, uh, that will have an immediate effect, probably that will be ready right now. So why are we are not doing? First of all, uh, I, I talk with some colleagues that are health economists, I move in the, in the area of health technology assessment, and they said to me, most of the public health interventions, and this is one of the public health interventions, if they are effective, they are cost effective, and as it, it has been demonstrated today. The second thing it is uh, we are, why we are not doing it. Uh, first of all, there are two movements uh, by which, or two criteria by which um, uh, screening programs are put in place. So the first thing it is acceptability. I think the, the, the this case it is fully acceptable. So that means that uh, most of the of the uh, well uh, patients and, and in this case in the families we we are at the very beginning we are not talking about patients we are we are talking about children so uh, and, and the families will accept that. And the second thing it is affordability. So making an, an analysis of which could be the cost of uh, first of all uh, providing the the test and second. Uh, structuring a program that uh, that could include the registration of the of the cases, I don't think it is it is not affordable by by most of the systems even in in middle income countries. So the issue is once again it is affordability and acceptability, and also showing to the decision makers that they are going to achieve uh, something in the future, but uh, but that the that the countries, the regions, or the systems they will be uh, thankful for what they have done. So um, I'm uh, very grateful to be part of this of this panel. I'm very grateful that we have uh, uh, a challenge uh, ahead. That uh, it is something that is first of all achievable because we have the test, we have the population, we have the outcomes that are, that will be done in the future, and we have also the way of management to change the future. So on that basis, um, uh, um, I, I would say the same as uh, Martin Haller. So please go ahead. And, uh, and, and please convince uh, politicians. Obviously, HTA bodies will have something to say in this regard, but uh, please convince with data the, the politicians or the decision makers in, in terms of making the investment. Uh, thank you very much. You come to a very important point about convincing ministers of finance uh, about the cost effectiveness of the screening pro uh, programs. So how would you uh, suggest we go forward and uh, do it? Let's go back to Professor Ray and uh, do the whole round, please. Thanks, Lali. So I think, you know, we have to think, we, when we think about this, there are those already in adulthood who are much more advanced walking around and it's those silent voices, if you will, and waiting for bad things to happen. Some of those, as you saw early, will be found through opportunistic testing because now every time somebody has a test of some sort, it often, they're often having, having cholesterol measurements. So there's, there's a program around that. We need to make sure that when people go into hospital early on, we find those people, particularly when their cholesterol levels are high. So there's much more in, in that area that we also need to think about. 
But then you've got those people yet to be born where the, the or children where actually we can do the most good. And I think what we've got to agree today is not, so today let's at least agree what good looks like, what we should aim to do. That does not mean that every country has to tomorrow or overnight invest in a certain amount to put it into practice within a year. No, each country can look to implement what good looks like at a steady pace that over a period of time provides affordable, sustainable policy implementation. But let's not argue what good looks like. We do know that child parent screening can work. And not only can it work, is that it is cost effective. You don't ex do that and do that only and exclude all of those other people because you won't find them necessarily. So there are plenty of opportunities for cascade testing of adults, opportunistic testing, wherever that happens. But what we're talking about is that investment now by starting at the root source for the future, we should be able to completely make the life or the lives of everybody born with this condition forever so much better. So let's at least agree what good looks like. Thank you so much. And Professor Santos, for low uh, to middle income countries, it's especially a challenge to convince the ministers of finance or health to move forward. So any suggestions? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question in, indeed. Actually, uh, I think first we must tell the, the politicians that SH is, is a disease that, that starts uh, from birth. And, and, and really the most affected people will have heart attacks, uh, who might die, actually are young people. So the data that has been shown that at 13 fold increment on, on the risk of myocardial infarction or coronary heart disease between the age of 25 and 39. I think this is extremely important and remarkable. The second thing that we need to tell uh, the politicians and people who really administer our health system is that we can make diagnosis of FH with very inexpensive tests. A cholesterol test is cheap. It, 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 okay, we, you might say, oh, you might need uh, advanced genetic techniques and so on that might cost a lot of money. Okay, but we don't need that. Okay, if you have genetic tests, it's great, right? Uh, but not necessary, especially in, in low-income countries, okay? And, and third, the therapies that, that are available uh, are not expensive anymore for a long, long time. They're all generic medications. They, they cost pennies, and they can make a lot of difference if we start using them very early. I think these are the three pillars that, that we really need to, to bring and, and try to convince uh, the, 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 the people who really can make the difference and, and, and run the system in order to make diagnosis and to, uh, in order to start therapy and to prevent early disease. That, that's how I see it. Uh, Professor Pinto, any additional uh, suggestions on how to go forward? Well, I, I would say that, uh, um, again, uh, here is the issue of communication and to provide the data. We have tons of studies showing the cost effectiveness on the treatment of hypercholesterolemia or dyslipidemia. So there is data, there is evidence. It's not lack of evidence, we have that. And particularly now, in this specific group of, uh, uh, of patients with the familiar hypercholesterolemia, actually, uh, we have a strong argument, which is about the workforce. We're dealing here with a very young population. It's children and young adults. So here we are dealing with uh, uh, basically uh, removing workforce, early workforce uh, from, um, from the population. One, second, the fact that we treat these patients, we actually avoiding um, that uh, these patients develop complications, meaning hospitalizations. And all of these, of course, and we have a health economist here, is included when you do all these studies. So if there is a population where cost effectiveness can be easily shown, and it has actually been shown, it's in this population. 
because these are and uh, not even mentioning the the emotional fact that we are dealing i think if we look at children we are dealing with safe uh, uh, children's lives it's not nice to see a five-year-old having an acute myocardial infarction and having as was shown today and having sudden death because it was not known that he had this condition and he was not properly treated so I think we have more than enough arguments, more than enough evidence, even cost effectiveness uh, studies that can clearly show the advantage of identifying these uh, patients and convincing also the ministries of uh, finances, even if they think on short, on short term, uh, even that uh, will be enough uh, to sustain implementation of measures to do early screening. And as uh, was mentioned by, by Professor Santos, it's not uh, expensive just to do a, a simple screening uh, for, uh, for high cholesterol. Because basically we are identifying the small group or relatively small group of people that then will may need more, more complex uh, um, uh, uh, studies or, uh, and, and more expensive. And keep in mind, uh, this is also a society decision. As a society, you know, do we want to invest more on health or do we want to invest more on other issues? And I'm not going to mention those because this is also a societal problem. And that's where the politicians and the decision makers have to make decisions. But we have data and we have data to support uh, implementation of measures such as what we are discussing here, which is early screening of uh, these patients. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Halle, any uh, further suggestions for Europe? Definitely, because um, I would like to address again why. I mean, we do have screening in, in, um, with, at birth and in children all along in, for different other uh, diseases, hypothyroidism, phenylketonuria, and, and others. Why not do it for cholesterol? There's no reason why not to do this. And uh, the cost effective issue is not an issue because uh, for these others like hypothyroidism, phenylcotonuria, uh, there's, um, uh, th there's also uh, the, the cost effectiveness is not the issue, it is saving lives. So um, this is um, the, the, the money issue, although it's very low, the money is not, issue is not, uh, not an issue, it is saving lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez Iberluzia, I know you have to leave shortly, but uh, would you like to make any final comments before we close? Any suggestions? Yeah, I think we, I think we need to learn from uh, how other screening programs have been established. So uh, which was the basis for uh, establishing an, um, an screening program at the population basis on breast cancer? or colorectal cancer, or um, trisomia 20, 21st, or the, the uh, in most occasions, so those that are, that are occurring in the case of children, uh, that is, for example, the, the, the screening programs for deafness. I think we need to, to learn how they were implemented and why they were implemented. First of all, yeah, I think it is a policy statement. I think it is crucial, and, uh, and also to share that with, with governments. Second, to establish an international scientific, um, uh, I would say, conference in which uh, the the figures are, are shared with uh, with the community, but also with politicians, and also that they establish um, how to to uh, to put in place a screening program, which are the type of tests that will be required, which are the the cutoff points that are, that will be uh, defined, and also uh, which could be the possible cost for for each of the of the countries. And on that basis, um, decision makers and investors, they will have a chance to, to look at, at that. And also to, to try to reinforce uh, one of the things that, I, that I've said before, it is if one country starts, probably it is a movement that, uh, that will create like a domino. So uh, every, every single country will, will also implement the, the screening program. I wanted to thank very much uh, for being uh, able to, uh, to, meet, to meet in this, in this panel. So interesting, and, uh, and I look forward to, uh, to also helping implementing the screening programs on, on familial hypercholesterolemia in Europe and in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. So everything we've spoken about in this panel is achievable with the right political will and smart investment. And I would like to thank all the panelists for their contributions and really hope that today is the day we move forward. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Lali. Thanks very much to you.
The session really underlined there's, there's a clear consensus about FH pediatric screening, why it makes sense, and why it has to happen now. Science, partnership, data, know-how, urgency from both a human and an economic perspective are all really key. And now it's time to hear from policymakers and other stakeholders to really drill down on how to move forward with the recommendations that we've listened to today. And I'd like to kick off with Dr. Moitza Gobetz, Head of the Sector for Disease and Injury Prevention at the Public Health Directorate of the Slovenian Ministry of Health and also clearly representing the Slovenian, Slovenian EU presidency. First of all, a really big thank you to you for all of your support in organising this technical meeting. It has been truly appreciated. Just jumping back to last month and the launch of the Cardiovascular Health Alliance, we heard very loud and very clearly, let's prevent the preventable. That was the mantra. Based on your experience in Slovenia, Moitza, what are your thoughts on, on what you've heard today and how we can really shift gear and set the direction for universal cascade and opportunistic pediatric screening across Europe? First of all, thank you for inviting me and for the opportunity to share with you the view of the and aspiration of Slovenian uh, presidency regarding the today topic. The fact is that the CVD are the leading cause of death in the EU and being responsible for 87% of disease burden and 36% uh, of all deaths, major gaps in CVD prevention and early detection must be addressed. And considering the disease burden and the impact of disruption in healthcare system caused by COVID-19, further strengthening of health promotion as well as prevention and treatment of non-communicable diseases is urgently needed. And Slovenia acknowledged this in the council conclusion, which will be adopted by health ministers in December. And furthermore, we invite Commission and Member States to take a comprehensive approach on health promotion and prevention and early detection of cancer, but also to ensure that best practices developed in cancer prevention and control can benefit also other non-communicable diseases. We heard about this also in the previous uh, panelists, because we see parallels between um, FH screening and population-based cancer screening programs, which are today widely available in member states. They are based on strong evidence and on consensus on experts all around Europe. And also policymakers agreed that screening programs are important element of effective cancer control policy at the national and the EU level. And we have to reach this also for the uh, FH screening. Um, we heard that Slovenia, in Slovenia, we have already introduced national-wide universal FH pediatric screening in early 1995. And we see it as a model and efficient strategy to identify individuals at risk, uh, to treat them accordingly and also children and also their parents. And we see opportunities for European Commission to support member states to work to together on agreeing on evidence-based recommendation on FH screening through new health program using instruments like joint action and maybe some other instruments within other financial mechanisms. And Slovenia, as my minister said in the morning, stands ready to be an active partner and help other interested countries to de develop and introduce FH screening programs. To conclude, during our presidency, we put forward sharing good practice and investment in innovation in healthcare system to build efficient and resilient health systems including health promotion, prevention, and early detection 
to be an integral parts of future health system. We believe that by shared learning and collaboration between expert communities, parent association, policy makers from member states, European Commission and European Parliament, we can make the FH screening in EU a reality without leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gobech. That was a very powerful statement and leads us nicely to the European Parliament. Uh, MEP Busoy, Christian, you're widely known for your unstinting commitment to health in the European Parliament, co-chair of the interest group on equitable access to healthcare being one, one of many, many activities and commitments. Could you comment on Dr. Gobich's remarks? What would you suggest the concrete steps could be? Also thinking about the maxim that we heard earlier of leaving no one behind. What might be the role of the European Parliament? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Beniklon. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm happy to uh, see again uh, some of the distinguished participants, uh, Dr. Janta and uh, many others, uh, who discussing a very important and interesting uh, issue. And uh, I would like just to express the full support uh, on behalf of uh, myself, but also I'm sure I can talk on behalf of many colleagues from European Parliament uh, very much involved in uh, uh, supporting initiatives in the area of health. And when, when we discuss, uh, discuss about prevention and screening and pediatric screening, I'm sure that uh, the support is uh, very high. So once again, thank you for the invitation uh, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, organizing a debate for the need for a call for action on pediatric screening for familial hypercholesterolemia. Major chronic uh, cardiovascular diseases are too often uh, not diagnosed uh, until serious complications arise. European Commission's program for the union section in the field of health and the EU for Health program uh, will play a key role in ensuring that early and effective screening can lead to better health outcomes for uh, all Europeans. And uh, I totally agree with uh, the representative of the Slovenian presidency of uh, European Union uh, that we need to act uh, as soon uh, as possible. Recent academic research shows that uh, FH is significantly underdiagnosed and undertreated in the general population in all European Union. Uh, still nine out of 10 people born with FH is undiagnosed. In addition, there are concerning gaps in diagnosis from one country to another. It is uh, striking to learn that, that the diagnosis rate of FH is uh, less than 1% in some European countries when we consider the devastating consequences of this disease if not discovered timely and left untreated. Uh, I had the chance uh, before uh, also in a good cooperation uh, with you to uh, participate or host uh, some debates uh, uh, on um, FH. One of the conclusions of each meeting was the need to raise awareness across Europe so that better policies protecting the health of our citizens can be developed and uh, implemented. So awareness is uh, of crucial importance given the high risk of FH. Uh, early screening is also of crucial importance. You will, some, maybe not you, some will tell that uh, this is something that the member states uh, uh, should uh, take uh, care because uh, uh, health policies and the organization of the health sector and uh, of course what is important what is a priority is still a matter of subsidiarity and the member states has the full prerogatives but i believe that we could do something from the eu level european union has a key role to play and this is why we need this european call to action one that would emphasize the importance of uh, pediatric screening uh, as well. Because uh, identifying FHS as early in life as possible is vital, treatment and support can be offered from an early age, and then the people in that question take action and know the risks of uh, lifestyle choices. It is very important that children, but also adults, don't start smoking if they have this uh, disease. Smoking causes damage to the arteries and integral step 
in the development of heart and uh, circulatory disease. And this is just an example. Therefore, I fully support a call to, a call to action that would call for uh, the development of new strategy dedicated uh, to the prevention of cardiovascular diseases, including a section for uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, I believe that uh, this call for action, and I will support this, should promote an exchange of best practice on uh, screening programs and patient registries that would include also the dimension of pediatric screening programs. And of course, we need to fund research projects aiming to improve early diagnosis of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. Indeed, it is ambitious, but uh, if we don't uh, act now, maybe the situation will be even worse in the future. And do not forget that we have a momentum for health now at the EU level with the EU for Health program, with the, uh, the Horizon Europe uh, health trend, extremely important, the digital Europe with a very much focus on health issues. And of course, with uh, the fact that people, uh, the decision makers, but also citizens understand maybe better with this uh, awful pandemics, the need to invest more in health and to be more careful to the health systems. Thank you very much and uh, wishing you a very successful event. Thank you so much, MEP Buzoy. I think thank you also for raising the importance of, of raising awareness about FH uh, because the level of understanding, as we've heard during the entire afternoon, is very low. You put attention on to the European Commission and interestingly, the opportunities around re research. And it's now my pleasure to welcome Hélène Leborgne from DG Research and Innovation in the European Commission. A warm welcome to you, Hélène. In the light of the new European Health Union and as MEP Busso highlighted, increased Commission support, uh, greater investment in health at European level, how can we see a, a strengthened approach to FH paediatric screening with the support of the European Commission? What are the opportunities from a research perspective and how can we learn from initiatives such as the European reference networks? And then the floor is yours. Thank you for the question. Um, obviously, I will answer from the research perspective as you, as you kindly requested and also because I'm based in DG Research and Innovation of the Commission. So from a research perspective, the FH community is very well embedded, I would say, in scientific activities. And we can really say that the knowledge is there and duly recognized. I'm saying this because the commission already supported through its um, various previous research programs, FP6, FP7, and most lately Horizon 2020. So already supported projects on cardiovascular and uh, metabolic disease, for example. And the most... Um, important example we have here is the support to the European, to, sorry, to the International Consortium for Personalized Medicines called shortly IC Permed, which was funded under Horizon 2020. And there FH was featured as a best practice example back in November, 2018. It's an example of personalized medicine research and implementation. Obviously, if further research is needed, the current Horizon Europe research program will support. And there, I would say that in addition of um, the usual collaborative uh, projects funded, you might think also of more structuring initiatives such as the partnerships, um, which are key new instrument in the landscape. For example, one starting next year on transforming health and care systems, but also another one on personalized medicine and one on rare disease starting a bit later in 2023-24. So certainly this are initiative where the FH community could more carefully look at. Now more from a healthcare perspective uh, still, um, we can learn indeed from initiatives such as the European reference networks that you mentioned. So these networks they do focus on rare disease and condition, but the main uh, lesson we can learn from them is that as European network, you are stronger. It makes you stronger. For example, in the, um, in the field of healthcare, you could look at how um, your ERNs, these this networks do um, have virtual consultations about uh, rare cases and rare forms of FH could certainly be, be discussed there if needed, obviously. 
more generally, the European reference networks they are also developing clinical practice guidelines. And because they are made by the key experts in the field, they become sort of gold standards and are widely recognized also at national levels. And last but not least, I would say that ERNs are also um, very structuring in the, the fact that they, they activate at national level um, uh, the trigger discussion and, and there are very important actors to discuss national strategies. So it can be inspiring in this, uh, in this respect as well. Thank you very much, Ellen. A, a nice overview of what is possible in the context of DG research, but also uh, looking at the European reference networks as, as a potential model moving forward. Turning now to uh, Marius Gianta, who we heard from a little earlier on this afternoon, uh, trustee of FH Europe, president of the Centre for Innovation in Medicine in Romania, and also a member of the European Consortium for Precision Medicines. You talked earlier today about the importance of innovation and how this will support FH paediatric screening. What do you believe to be the next policy steps, key policy steps in a nutshell? Yes, I think it's very important to build, uh, as Christian Boucher mentioned and Helen earlier, to build in the context of existing European programs, but also to focus on the same time at the national and the, region, uh, and the regional framework. At the EU level, of course, uh, we have the uh, research program, the, the Horizon Europe, the EU for Health already mentioned a lot of opportunities. Uh, opportunities in the years to come. Also, I think very important, especially in the context of the presentation around the FA Global Registry data. It's important to link, maybe link this with the European health data space, um, a very important initiative at uh, the European level. And also to take a look, was mentioned, the International Consortium for Personalized Medicine, also to, to start building the precision medicine for FH in the context of the uh, a new European Partnership for Personalized Medicine in 2023. As well, I think it's important to connect with the one plus million genome, another very important, I think, initiative at the EU level. And at the national levels, it's important to put the cardiovascular disease prevention and the innovation part of the uh, national strategies for, for health and uh, operational programs. It's important that these programs to meet the real needs of the citizen and, and the patients and to incorporate innovation in order to reduce or to, to avoid, to eliminate the risk of inequalities. It's very, very important actually to, to have in the same proposition the, uh, the innovation and the risk uh, of, uh, of inequalities. And uh, one more thought, uh, cholesterol, I think it's a victim of uh, its own notoriety. And um, we are all tempted to say that we know everything about cholesterol, but I think our today uh, discussion convinces us that uh, we still have a lot to, to learn. That's why it's very important to, to push for uh, health literacy programs, for personalized communication programs. Very, very important in, in order to maximize the potential of the early detection and screening programs. Excellent. So quite a menu. And you also stressed actually the importance of meaningful involvement of patients and citizens. And this brings me nicely to John Reeve, president of FH Europe. A warm welcome to you, John. And huge thanks for everything that FH Europe does to support your community and drive positive change. So how did the comments of your fellow panelists resonate with you from the perspective of FH patients and citizens in Europe? And what do you see as the role of FH Europe as a patient organization, citizens organization moving forward? Yeah, I have to say, Nicola, that, that the meetings left me feeling very positive and very optimistic with a real sense of dynamism. You know, it's fantastic to think that we're all united in recognizing the urgency of moving forward on this important issue which you know, we've heard affects a million and a half citizens and their families in, in the European Union alone. Um, we also have seen that the evidence clearly shows that pediatric screening with appropriate treatment is cost-effective in reducing the impact of cardiovascular disease and is even well established in a small number of countries as a model for us. Universal screening is, is fundamentally about patients and citizens' rights. And we owe, owe it to the patients and to the undiagnosed to bring all countries to the same level. And that's our job today. 
I'm particularly proud that this initiative that we have today comes from FH Europe's submission of good practice in FH screening to the DG Sante portal. And you know, some two or three years on, it's great to see this happening. And as well as treating FH, I'm confident that this can also be a model for screening for other inherited lipid conditions that lead to CVD, such as elevated LP little a. And I, I understand that the commission's uh, need to generalize disease families as much as possible. And I think this may be a way forward that, that will help them um, put this on the agenda at a higher priority. You know, the discussion has also given us excellent insights to strengthen our action plan, but we do need your continued input and cooperation to take this forward. Um, we'll share those plans with you as, as an output from the meeting. Great, thank you very much, John. Look, we've got a few minutes before I... I, I to Sorry, the John. Of FHU. You did ask me. Yes. About the role of FHU. Go ahead, um, John. Okay. Um, turning to that, yeah, I see FHU as a facilitator that gives the patient perspective and ensures that the needs of patients and citizens are met and that their rights are respected. respected. We do this by bringing multiple groups together, like today, patients, healthcare professionals, academics, policymakers, legislators, and industry. And we hope that you can all see us as, as a trusted partner. Our top priority now is to build the network further, to engage more countries, share best practice, foster awareness, and provide leadership in patient advocacy. And you know, this word leadership again. And all of this is about creating greater impact. We'll also encourage industry to provide targeted innovation in diagnostics and treatment, and to support digital transformation and the effective use of the wealth of data that's already been collected. As several speakers have said, this is about equity. No country should be left behind. It's a big task, but we're committed to build capacity at the European and country levels to make it happen. And, and you can be confident of our determination to achieve this. Great, and that was a very important piece on FH. Europe, excuse me for cutting you off there. No, so, I was a bit slow in getting and on. Not at all, not at all. So a few minutes left. Um, and what would be interesting from my perspective is to get a couple of final thoughts from the panel. So if we fast forward to three years from now, where do you imagine FH pediatric screening could be, having thought about everything we've learned, shared this afternoon? It'd be great just to get a very, very brief, brief glimpse. Uh, first of all, from Marius Gianta. Yes, I see in three years' time, uh, FH uh, screening implemented in many European countries based on, as I mentioned, on innovation and personalized medicine and on data and the state of the art uh, technology. For that, is, of course, it's, it's important to work together to collaborate and to co-create. Co-creation, excellent. And Helen Lebourg, what are your views? Yeah, I think that now at European level, the FH community has reached a solid, no, solid knowledge basis, uh, recognized as best practice, as I was saying earlier, both on research side, but also more recently on the healthcare side, because uh, I think your FH uh, best practice was accepted on the best practice portal from um, DG Santé colleagues. So to me, it's really time for action now. Um, and the FH community can fully feel legitimate to advocate for FH pediatric screening and to, to leverage on the best practice, which are already fully recognized. So I could imagine that in three years time, more member states do implement FH pediatric screening. Also, I'm also sure it's not an easy, um, an easy way to go. Another more tiny type of advice I would have is to, um, to look for more work uh, with, with CRNs on the rare forms of uh, FH, for example. And my final message uh, to you as community would be to go on and I wish you success in your endeavors. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Shelen, for those encouraging words and to continue on this trajectory. And actually in the chat today, we heard that Croatia will implement uh, FH pediatric screening from 2022. So that's a very nice reflection, I think, of, of how things are moving forward positively. So, John, projecting yourself three years from now, what would you like to see? You're on mute, John. 
Thank you. I was saying, based on this meeting, um, yeah, if we can deliver on these actions and policy commitments, we're going to be very much closer to screening across Europe. You know, we, we do understand the importance of subsidiarity and competence so that initiatives happen at the right level. But we also understand the need to promote equity, and that requires a level of central coordination and funding, and that will have to happen. And I believe that within three years, there'll be clear acknowledgement of the need for FH screening, and that we'll also have identified a number of countries as pilots to disseminate current best practice. I also believe that FH Europe will be even stronger on the ground in three years, with more patient leaders ready to be partners and FH ambassadors. And I hope also, as I've said before, that it will be a model in other CBD areas and that we can share these learnings. Yeah, you know, what I hope now is that we all understand our respective roles and responsibilities and what we need to do to make it happen. And we will get on and do it. Fantastic, fantastic. Back to Slovenia and Dr. Gobic. Thoughts from your side um, in terms of where we should be in three years time? First of all, I believe that we should built on momentum now. Um, COVID-19 showed us that we should invest in more resilient health system, that we should invest also in prevention, in early detection, um, in health promotion. Uh, I think that um, as, as it has been already said, that the issue of age, um, um, family hypercholesterolemia screening is now very high on the agenda. We have the evidence, we have the recognition from the research side, also from the um, uh, um, Sante side, from the commission. We have an opportunity with new digital agenda, so we should build on. And in uh, my vision would be that in three years, um, many of European countries should have in place the population screening of H, uh, FH, and uh, much more, many more death uh, because of this a disease will be prevented. Fantastic. And thank you for your leadership in all of this. Fun, really very, very much appreciated. Back to the European Parliament and MEP Boussoy. Three years from now, what should be happening from your perspective? I think your messages were very clear on the equity dimension as well, leaving no country behind. But where would you like the whole story to be? in three years time? In three years time, I hope that uh, the knowledge, the awareness will be much, much higher uh, among, of course, uh, policy makers, but also among general population because it is also a matter of uh, personal responsibility and the need uh, to, to, to know exactly what are uh, the conditions and how we can prevent, uh, how we can screen, uh, how we can, uh, live uh, and how we can uh, manage this disease. And of course, as all the other distinguished uh, panelists, I really hope that uh, screening and uh, especially, of course, uh, pediatric screening, so from the very early ages, uh, will be a reality in all member states. And here, equity, reducing inequalities, access to everyone uh, is extremely important. And what you are doing uh, today, what you did in the past, what you'll do in the future will uh, be very helpful. And of course, each of us in our member states where we can influence uh, things, we should uh, make this happen in three years to have everywhere uh, at least uh, one uh, pediatric screening program and much, much more awareness. Thank Excellent. you so much and good luck. Thank you very much. And your support is also very, very much appreciated. Thank you. So uh, I would now like to give the floor back to John Reeve to share some closing remarks. And he will also give the floor to Professor Battellino um, to close the meeting formally. And from my side as moderator, warmest thanks to all of you, speakers, panelists and participants during the entire afternoon. It's been a pleasure to moderate this really very powerful session. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you, Nicola, and, and thank you so much for your, your excellent moderation of the session today. We began the session with patients, with the moving stories of two patients suffering with FH, and I feel very privileged to close it as a representative of, of our European network of patient organisations. It's been a very powerful meeting, 
we've seen strong consensus and commitment from all parties on the next steps for FH pediatric screening in Europe. Our journey this afternoon started with the stark reality of patients who live with this most common un undiagnosed condition and the tragedies that could have been avoided. We heard about the unmet needs of millions of patients and citizens in the greater Europe with FH and therefore at risk from premature heart attack and stroke. Then we looked at how the wider cardiovascular disease community is uniting to drive this long awaited change. We were given a global perspective and a reminder of how the global call for action has inspired our work. And we learned about the powerful evidence base for FH pediatric screening in the global registry. We honed in on good practice in several European countries, which can both serve as a model and inspire us moving forward by showing what's really possible and its demonstrated impact on people's lives. On the basis of this experience, a series of key recommendations has been developed, which maps out the way forward. In the session on consensus building, our close allies and fellow stakeholders discussed these and were unequivocal in their view that we can build on these achievements to date. We, we do not need to reinvent the wheel, but we do need to address fragmentation and piecemeal approaches. FH pediatric screening in the EU and the wider Europe is achievable with the right political will, smart investment, and genuine partnerships that include patients and citizens as equal players. This was reiterated in our final session of the day, in which we discussed with policymakers how to move forward, covering the role of national governments, the role of the European institutions, and the role of groups like FH Europe. Today, I believe we've agreed on a common vision and a common mission. As I said a few minutes ago, in, in three years time, we can be well on the way to a systemic approach to FH pediatric screening in all European countries. We will shortly have a robust action plan strengthened through your contributions. And we all have a distinct and a collective role to play in this. The time to act is now. As Professor Gidding said, We've been talking about it since the 1998 Geneva meeting with very uneven progress. We all agree today that now the time is right. We need to move to implementation and get the job done. We're delighted that the Slovenian EU Council Presidency has championed this work to mobilize fellow member states. And we look to the upcoming French presidency to pick up the baton. The message from the commission is loud and clear. There are opportunities through new funding programs to nurture and support EU cooperation on FH screening. It's also clear that we have the backing of the vibrant European Heart Group. As president of FH Europe, I commit my organization to being a convener, an accelerator, and if I might say, a, a benevolent watchdog to ensure that we deliver on our commitments today. I'd like to thank the speakers, the panelists, the organizers, and all those who worked very hard to ensure the success of this afternoon's meeting. We will circulate a summary report with the highlights and the action plan. And I look forward to our continued engagement with every one of you to make FH pediatric screening a reality in Europe.